Hey guys, welcome to Work, Power, and Simple Machines. I thought this would be neat to try since I'll be out today and uh, all you need to do is just really get the notes so that we can move on and do some activities and some labs. So the great thing about this is if you need to stop and write what's on the screen, just press pause. Um, and if you need to go back, go back. This is great. So let's talk about work. What is work? Well, work is using a force to move an object over a distance. Now, the important thing here is to remember that they have to both be in the same direction. Um, if you're applying a force to an object, such as holding up a box, and you're moving a different direction, you're traveling forwards, then you're not doing any work on the box. It has to be in the same direction. So applying a force to an object, moving it a distance, as long as it's in the same direction, you're doing work on an object. So according to this scientific definition, which is work and which is not? What about a teacher lecturing to her class, kind of like I'm doing now? Um, or a mouse pushing a piece of cheese with its nose across the floor? Which of these is actually doing true work? Now, of course, one of these is getting paid for what they're doing. The other is not. But the one that is truly doing the work is the mouse. The mouse is using a force to move the cheese a certain distance, and both the force and the motion are in the same direction. So the mouse is the one that's actually doing the work in this case. So kind of test yourself. Which one of these is work? We've got a scientist delivering a speech, a bodybuilder lifting weights, a mom carrying her baby from room to room, um, a father pushing a carriage with a baby in it, or a woman carrying a grocery bag to her car. Well, the scientist might be getting paid for it, but he's not doing work. There's no force on any object, not moving at any distance. Now, the bodybuilder is doing work. He's lifting the weight up. He's supporting its weight. It's moving up. And so, yes, he is doing work on the weights. The mom carrying her baby, she's applying her force to the bottom of the baby, holding it up. But she herself is moving around side to side. So, no, she is not doing work on the baby. She's just holding it. She's doing work on herself, her body moving her forward, but she's not doing work on the baby. The father, on the other hand, is pushing the baby carriage forward. It is moving forward. So, that is the definition of work. And then the lady carrying her grocery bag in, um, to her car is not doing work. She's holding it up just like the mom carrying the baby. She's holding it up, but she is going side to side, so they're not in the same direction. To find work, we'll use force times distance. Um, the unit of force is newtons. Distance is meters. Work should be newton meters, but thank goodness they named it after somebody, making it a lot more interesting. The unit of work is a joule, J-O-U-L-E. Um, not like the jewelry jewel, but the person jewel. All right, so let's try it. We'll use our formula force times distance. Uh, we've got a problem here. It says if a man pushes a concrete block 10 meters with a force of 20 newtons, how much work has he done? We'll put in the 20 newtons for the force. We'll put in the 10 meters for the distance. Multiply those together and we get 200 joules. 20 times 10 is 200. Okay, power. Very simply, power is the rate at which we're doing work. Um, the faster we're able to do work, the more power we are expending. So power is found by taking work and dividing it by time. And of course, remember, work is force times distance. So we might have to use force and distance and time. But once we get our answer for power, the unit is the watt, again, named after a person, W-A-T-T. So here's a problem. Watt is the power generated by a student pushing a cart with 20 newtons of force down a 30 meter hallway if it takes her 75 seconds to make that trip. Get it? Watt is the power. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we'll use work as force times distance. We'll plug in our force of 20 newtons and our distance of 30 meters to get 600 joules of work being done. And then the amount of time that it takes her to do that work will be her power. So we'll put in the 600 joules of work, divide it by the 75 seconds it took her, and we get 8 watts of power. But I'm a mere human. I have too much work to do. I don't have enough power to get the job done. Well, enter machines. Machines are going to help us do our work. Not these machines. Nope. Can you name the movie these are from? It's The Matrix. Simple machines. Machines are a device that help make work easier. 
Um, and they can accomplish that any number of ways. They can either transfer a force from one place to another. They can change the direction of a force. They can increase the magnitude of the force, the amount of that force. Or they can increase the distance or speed of the force. And the whole idea is to get a mechanical advantage. Now, mechanical advantage um, we would calculate by taking the input force and the output force. We really want more out than we put in. That would be the best advantage. So we'll take the ratio of output force divided by input force. Um, if that comes out to be greater than 1, then awesome. We've got a very good mechanical advantage. Now, it doesn't always change the force. Sometimes it can change the distance. Um, and in that case, we would again do output divided by input, but in this case, use the distance. And no machine can increase both the magnitude and the distance of the force at the same time. We'll see when we talk about our simple machines how each of them affect it, but they're not usually going to do both. The six simple machines you've probably been talking about since you're in like maybe fourth grade. Um, you've got the lever, the wheel and axle, the pulley, incline plane, wedge, and screw. And each of these six are going to help us accomplish the work that we need to do. They might change the force, they might change the distance, but they're going to help us do the work that we need to do. First one is a lever. Um, a lever is a rigid bar that rotates around a fixed point called the fulcrum. The fulcrum is kind of like the pivot point where it rotates around. Um, so we'll have both an effort force that goes into it, what we're applying, and we'll have a load or resistant force, whatever we're trying to support or move. And there's three different classes of levers, all depending on where the load, the effort force, the load force, the fulcrum, where all of those are located. That's going to help determine those three classes of levers. Um, each of them, however, is going to be found with the mechanical advantage just doing the output divided by the input. Now, it could be output force divided by input force or the length of the arm divided by the length of the effort. Either way, we're going to try to get that advantage um, from the three different types of levers. First class of lever um, is you have the fulcrum located between the effort and the resistant forces, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide you can uh, copy down. Your first class levers include crowbars, scissors, pliers, and what we're doing is changing the direction of the force. So, for example, kind of like a seesaw, you've got the effort force being applied downward, the resistant force, the load, is being supported upward. And it's a lot easier for us to pull down because we have gravity on our side. Gravity is helping us push down. So changing that direction of force, it's easier to push down and as a result lift a box up than it would be to just pick up the box. So there's your first class lever. You can label effort, fulcrum, and resistance. Second class lever, the load is between the fulcrum and the effort force. And again, I'll show you a picture on the next slide. Examples of second class are nutcrackers, wheelbarrows, and doors. And it doesn't change the direction of the force. What we've done is increased the force. We get a mechanical advantage here. So here's your second class lever. You've got the fulcrum there. Here's the load that we're trying to lift. And there's the effort force. And so by in, by pulling up on the effort force way out here, we're able to support that load. It helps increase that force that we're putting into it. Third class, effort force is between the fulcrum and the resistant force. Examples would be tweezers, hammers, and shovels. We're not going to change the direction again. We're going to get either a gain in speed or distance, which will end up giving us a decrease in force. So here's your third class lever. Your effort is here close to your fulcrum. Think about like tweezers. You put your fingers close to that end, uh, the end where it is held together. And your resistance force is way out here. Okay, wheel and axle. You get a large wheel securely to, uh, rigidly secured to a smaller wheel. And it changes the distance over which you're applying your force. So think like a screwdriver or a doorknob. Um, you apply a very large distance, apply your force over a very large distance, and you end up getting that force applied over a very small distance down here at the end. 
And so that gives us an advantage because we can apply it over a farther distance and we won't have to use as much force to do the same amount of work. Pulleys change the direction and that will give us a mechanical advantage depending on how the pulley is arranged. Um, a fixed pulley just changes the direction. It doesn't go up or down with the load that's being moved. So this up here where it's secured to the top would be a fixed pulley and it merely changes the direction. Just like the seesaw, it's, it's easier to pull down with gravity on your side than it would be to pick the object up. Movable pulleys will go up and down with the load. It might be attached to the load and you do get a mechanical advantage. Um, but it doesn't change the direction of the force. You end up still having to pull upwards. If you have a pulley attached to a box, you're still having to pull up, but you get that advantage because the weight is distributed between the two ropes. So the mechanical advantage of a pulley is equal to the number of ropes that are supporting it. You could have several ropes going back and forth, up and down, and that would help give you more of a mechanical advantage. An inclined plane is a sloping surface. It could be a ramp. Um, anything like that. You have the effort distance and then the actual height is what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to lift a box to put it in a truck or take a person in a wheelchair and lift them up to the higher sidewalk. And so applying that effort over a longer distance means that you don't have to apply as much force at a time. Okay, to find the mechanical advantage you divide the length of the slope by the height of the ramp and that would give you that mechanical advantage of the inclined plane. Okay, so you can see here we've got a car going up a ramp at a 30 degree angle, a 45 and a 60. And notice how the force has changed down here. You're using less force um, with the lower slope because you're applying that over a longer distance. You see the displacements down here? You're going further in order to get to the height that you need but you're not having to do as much work at any certain period of time. I mean, not you're not having to use as much force at any certain, you're still doing the same amount of work. Okay, um, inclined planes, if you notice on winding passes through, mountain pass, uh, through mountains, they'll go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and that's really to get the lowest slope possible. You might have to go a longer distance to get from point A to point B, but you don't have to go as high as quickly as if you were just going straight up the mountain. It's a lot easier to do that. Okay, a wedge is really kind of a modification of the inclined plane. You may have one or two put back to back and you've got a sloping surface um, towards the outside. And think of a wedge as kind of forcing an object um, apart. It's moving the object up the inclined plane, pushing outwards, and so you're able to drive the object apart um, by putting the wedge into it. Like think of an axe splitting firewood. Okay, a screw, also a lot like an inclined plane, just kind of a modified version. You've got an inclined plane wrapped around um, this, this center part of the screw. And so by applying, it's just like the winding path up the mountain. You're applying that force over a long distance as it goes up and up and up. And it's a lot easier to do that than it would be to just wedge it straight in. Okay, so think of a screw as a big long inclined plane wrapped around almost like a wheel and axle. Mechanical advantage of a screw can be calculated by dividing the number of turns per inch. If you have a really tight screw with lots of tight threads, you get more advantage than if you had it more spread out. Efficiency, you're never going to get 100% efficiency. Some of your output force is going to be lost due to friction. So to find the efficiency of our machines, we'll take the input and divide it by the output multiply by 100 to get our percentage and you get the efficiency of your machine. So if the cyclist on a bicycle puts in 100 joules of work and then she gets 120 joules of useful work out of it, her efficiency would be the output divided by the input or 120 divided by 600 and she would get 20 percent efficiency of her bicycle. So where does the rest of that work go? Overcoming friction. 
Okay, I hope you all had a great time. Feel free to go back to anything that you've missed. Take the notes. I look forward to seeing you guys on Friday, and we'll discuss everything you need for the next week. Thanks.